Um, so that goes back. That goes, so let's see. I think it's just here. Okay. Here. Awesome. Okay. Okay. That's the one. All right. Great. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Up and down. Okay. Up and That's down. It. All right. Great. So we'll we'll just give people a few more minutes. Oops. And I. Are you so? Yeah, how about you? So we actually just last week um, we sold our house, um, and uh, we're going to move into the street. This is this is and so yeah. So so I just decided that uh, we so uh, the daughter is married with the Belfry, she's not here, she's here, she's here, and she has a uh, son, so we have one grandchild. Um, our son is in Ireland, so we play in the Our youngest is my good daughter, and she has a son. So, how about you? Uh, so, um, my oldest my daughter, she's a social worker at Rob. Um, her son sees his vision. He is a and our youngest very It's like the movies. Yeah. Wow. So he's doing stuff like that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I was, I've was i been a little sad about the whole, like, you know, song. Um, but, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think it's, it sort of makes sense. We, we, have, we have bought us more, you know, in Straterville, we were standing part of the week. So, yeah, we're facing the same thing. No, I'm There's, there's nothing on the there's forest, so uh, so our house sold within two days. It's not so it's kind of like, uh, yeah. It's kind of Yeah. Here, let me introduce you.
So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It is now a few minutes after the hour, which seems to be the appropriate time to start. Uh, so uh, welcome to the um, our our next uh, 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 interdisciplinary um, seminar series lecture. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce the speaker today. Um, who uh, has known me uh, since I was a surgical resident at Northwestern many years ago. He has promised not to share any stories of me as a resident. Um, and so uh, for that, I'm very grateful. Uh, George Sabolsky um, is a neurosurgeon um, uh, currently uh, at Humboldt Park Hospital, uh, I'm sorry, Humboldt Park Health. Um, uh, George, as I said, longtime uh, faculty member at Northwestern, we overlapped um, as faculty together for 10 years, um, uh, but he recently um, has moved to uh, Humboldt Park. Um, George has a BS from the University of Illinois and an MD from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, he uh, has been not only associate professor at Northwestern, but also um, chair of neurosurgery at Stroger Hospital. Um, he has an MBA from Loyola, uh, which he obtained in 2010. Um, and uh, he's been involved with the technological platform development to improve safety in surgery and disrupt barriers and inequity in spine care. Um, and uh, George is a longtime neighbor of mine. We live in the same town, River Forest, um, but I actually haven't seen him, I don't think, in like 18 years about. Uh, but it's really, he hasn't aged at all. It's amazing. We're not sure what he's doing, um, but it's truly uh, a pleasure for me um, to welcome George Sabelsky. So thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And um... It is uh, a great privilege and a pleasure for me to be here. I have sat uh, in those seats uh, when I was at Northwestern. I would come down here for um, presentations, uh, which were always good. So um, I want to assure you that I have worked uh, very, very hard uh, to uh, put this together, and I hope I hope you enjoy it. Uh, congratulations, Peter, uh, to you and your success and to being the director of this uh, fantastic uh, uh, center. Um, uh, I was behind you, even though you were behind me as a resident, I was a junior attending, I was behind you and really thinking about, even though I'd come here to hear some great talks, I was behind you and really kind of focusing on the ethical issues that we encounter in taking care of patients. But as time passed and uh, experiences uh, added up, I became more and more aware of disparities that are occurring uh, in our healthcare system. And, and so that's what brings me here today. So um, uh, I am, uh, I'm going to assure you that, uh, as I said, I've put a lot into this. I am an old school person in that I send letters uh, actually to people who I am impressed with and in their work. And I've received um, shocking letters back. And I'll, so uh, some of the people I'm going to reference today, you will know some of them. And after today, you will know them better. Uh, have responded, and um, these are people who are like-minded as ourselves, and and are you know attempting to make the world a better place. And some of these people, um, well, one person I, I didn't receive a reply, a reply from was a first-century um, rabbinical scholar um, uh, for obvious reasons, but um, uh, we're guided by his work, but. I've received replies from uh, Nobel Prize winning economists, uh, Don uh, Berwick, who um, most people know as the uh, former director of, um, of uh, uh, Medicare, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and started the um, Institute of, uh, for Health Improvement. I have a funny story about just talking with him last week about this what I'm gonna do, and he has my slides. And uh, 
And then I'm going to talk about some United States Marines and um, and how they figure into this and and um, and share with you uh, my experiences uh, with them, which are very, very personal. So um, we have a tough challenge um, in taking care of patients. And um, in 2019, I left Northwestern and had a couple years there where I was in uh, business and working on technological platforms and helped start a business to sterilize instruments uh, for the operating room. And that was all very interesting, but um, I missed taking care of patients because uh, the heart of you know those of us who are here, you know whether we're doing it from the front lines or whether we're supporting or whether we're interested in the background of taking care of patients, um, it it is something that's that's in us. And so, um, fortunately, I was able to um, return to uh, uh, clinical medicine. Uh, when one of my former fellows uh, called me up in uh, 2000, late 2020, uh, Daniel Ivankovich, and, and he asked uh, me if I was really retired. And I said, well, I, I guess kind of, I'm, I'm doing some things. He said, well, come to Norwegian American Hospital, uh, which is in Humboldt Park and has since been rebranded as Humboldt Park Health. Come come and work with me and see some patients and let's do some spine cases together, which he was our spine fellow at Northwestern. And so um, it's been a really a great uh, blessing for me to return to see patients. I see patients every week. And, and in the interim though, it, it became very apparent to me that um, it's really, even just with a hiatus of uh, maybe a year and a half in, from clinical medicine, the barriers that have that grew during that year and a half were astounding to me. And I'm talking about ordering an MRI for a patient of, uh, of their spine, obviously. I'm talking about getting clearance for surgery. I'm talking about a lot of work that um, I'm at a small place. I don't have a lot of help that, that I have to do in order to get people taken care of for their spine conditions. And I find it even more ironic because I used to be at Stroger Hospital, which is about five miles away, one of the biggest public hospitals uh, in the country. Right next door is uh, Rush Medical Center, a huge academic medical center. I've trained the head of that uh, Department of Neurosurgery, I've trained uh, some of the fellows when I was at Stroger and, you know, they'll, they'll do me a favor and get my patients in there for complex things. But, but, and so that's, you know, that's helpful, obviously, for me to break down some of these barriers. But when it comes to um, Aetna and, and Cigna and Illinois uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield managing Medicaid, which I don't know how that happened all of a sudden. Um, it's been a struggle. And so it really emphasized uh, for me the ethical barriers that now exist in taking care of patients at the area that is surrounding us here in Chicago. So I'm gonna talk about the, the following three things. These are the objectives. They roughly mirror what Aristotle in, in talked about with a rhetoric, and that is, I've already given you a little bit about myself and my credibility. And then I'm gonna talk about the logic of my uh, pursuit, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll finish up for, for discussion. I want to keep going backwards. There we go. Uh, amazingly, and I say this because I will get into it in regard to spine, um, I have never been a paid consultant for any spine instrument company. Never done that. 
I may have gotten a dozen golf balls from Stryker um, somewhere down the line, but I've never been a paid consultant, has never influenced my use of implants uh, in the spine. Fortunately, we're not talking about brain surgery here when we're talking about spine care, but it is a huge business. And um, it dwarfs actually now any brain surgery. The good news about brain surgery is that in a metropolitan area that we're in, no one who has an urgent uh, brain problem would be denied care. That's a, it's a law, obviously. For spine, that's a whole different um, thing. And it involves really some loosening, in my opinion, of the morality of taking care of patients. Healthcare, and I'm gonna differentiate, and I wrote a book on this and it'll be out by the end of the year called, uh, Can We Manage to Save Healthcare? Healthcare is a business, make no mistake about it. It's to be differentiated from patient care. What we do in the hospital here in the clinics is patient care. All the rest of it, maintaining this lovely auditorium, the buildings, parking, uh, on and on and on, the implants, et cetera, that's all business. And it's exceedingly complicated. It makes our work uh, uh, very complicated. And so despite decades, and, 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 and I have the, had the um, privilege, I've been lucky, uh, first I've had the privilege, but I've been lucky enough to be around since the late 1970s as a medical student, the technical and scientific progress that we've made in taking care of patients still is not distributed in a way that is equitable. And getting back to uh, Humble Park Health, advancing health equity, that's our mission. So everyone who's involved with it I don't think the, the the nice man who, you know, is in the, what what I would call an orderly back in the day uh, knows what that really means, but it's there. It's there for people to at least see that um, that's something that we we're aiming for. We waste and, and we spend and we waste an inordinate amount of money on healthcare the business. A lot of it is siphoned off from actual patient care. And, you know, we're in a fantastic medical center here, top of the line training program. I've been in others. And the fact that we have this ability on the one hand to train people and to provide, you know, any type of technical apparatus to take care of a patient and still not able to get that to all the people that need it is, uh, it's mystifying in a sense, and uh, in my opinion, borders on the, on the criminal. It talks about what we value as a society. And unfortunately, ethical lapses, um, punctuate the delivery of healthcare because of what we value. And I'll get uh, to more of that in a minute. And so if in thinking about today, if we wanted to uh, think about an ethical dilemma of healthcare of the greatest magnitude, we need look no further than do we uniformly provide access to safe, high quality health care, patient care that is across our region and across the country. 
we're part of this system. So this dilemma rests also solely with us. Not solely, it also rests with us. Um, as I said, uh, I will not hesitate to uh, fax uh, uh, information uh, to an insurance company in order to get a patient's surgery approved. I mean, if that's what I need to do, that's what I do. But um, it's way beyond that. Um, these reviews that occur uh, to get an MRI to get, or to get a patient reviewed is, is, is really, and even yesterday in my clinic, a patient could not get uh, Norco 10, post-op patient, Norco 10 milligrams because he was in some Medicaid managed care plan where they only approve five milligrams. So the uh, prescription that I authored for him had to be uh, uh, purged and we had to go to five milligrams and they told me how many I could um, uh, prescribe. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just, to me, it's criminal that um, there's that degree of oversight in a relationship that they have no idea um, I have with this patient. And uh, it's just, differential accountability and, and really the accountability rests with us ultimately in taking care of a patient, but um, we have to make do sometimes, as I said, with what is uh, allowed by particular insurance plans. So uh, Thomas Paine, um, you know, to be frank here, um, Toleration is not the opposite of intoleration, but it's the counterfeit of it. Both are despot despotisms. It really is that significant. Compromising patient care based on the mechanics of the system of, of finance. Uh, Pogo had a, a, in, a, in the comic strip, um, you know, the following saying. And um, so we are to blame uh, to a degree. It's differential accountability. We put up with it. And some people not only put up with it, some providers, and, and, I, and I use that word, that word very uh, loosely, some people who take care of patients, you know, are more adaptable is not the word, but more you know, they'll, they'll, they'll let things go uh, more than others. But it strikes at this inequality, this inequity of patient care. So uh, the, the uh, so again, with Aristotle uh, putting a, together a talk, uh, ethos, logos, pathos. So for me, uh, the ethos was uh, reading this book when I was about 12 years old, I still have my copy up here somewhere. I brought it along today. And I can't say that that's what made me want to be a brain surgeon, but it definitely made me want to be a doctor. And, and that's what separates us from the other branches of, of support that are in this business of healthcare. Yet we're under fire. And so I got an MBA a few years ago because I wanted to understand what was going on with the, the, the finances and the economics and the um, uh, ethics and, of uh, business. And it was very interesting and, and it just kept me researching and researching and, and brought me to where I am today. This inequity of patient care, it's not just for spine care. It occurs every day with countless other types of illnesses that are confronted or not confronted or not um, directed to where they need to be managed uh, best. 
So the story goes that um, Rabbi Hillel was asked, uh, what is the, uh, so there was a man and he asked two rabbis, uh, another rabbi and Rabbi Hillel, if he could convert to Judaism. And the man said, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but you know, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to understand it in the quickest way possible. And so the other rabbi beside Rabbi Hillel said, uh, this is going to take you years. You know, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to, to do this. So Rabbi Hillel, as the story goes, said, um, here's what it is. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. He said, all the rest is commentary. Now go and study. So that's my talk um, so far. Healthcare is a business. It's a big business. Medical care, treatment of patients is not a business. It's a relationship. It's a humane service. It's a connection. And it's being assaulted by the business aspects of healthcare. So that's it. We've got to go. We got to make a difference and let's get cracking on it. So understanding the economics of it uh, starts with a guy named Adam Smith, the, the, the father of economics. He was a Scottish philosopher and even back then, and he wrote the book literally on the first book of economics. And literally back then, he was conflicted because before he wrote the, the book on um, economics published in 1776, he had written a, a preceding book in 1759 on the morality of, of the, uh, how we treat each other. And so he understood on one hand that morality is a huge part of motivation for economics. And so since the 1700s, we've been grappling with this since. And I think right now in healthcare, we're really struggling with it. Adam Smith is famous for the invisible hand, the motivation, these virtues and ethics and things that um, we utilize when we interact with others. We emphasize that in our training in the healing arts. This competes, if you will, with the visible hand, that is what is happening for us to be able to do our work. And what do we need to do our work? Robots and, and spine surgery, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. He invented economics as part of political economy. And that's the, that's the background for what we are dealing with, with healthcare in the United States and the world today. It's political science and politics meeting economics and how they interact to provide social services. So on the face of it, with Adam Smith's background as a moral philosopher and, a, and the first economist, we should have a well-balanced approach to providing patient care services. And in fact, Edmund Phelps has written a book on this, in which he talks about economics aim as being mass flourishing. Now, Professor Phelps is 93 years old, and I'm happy to say I wrote to him, and he wrote back. And he said, and I shared this philosophy with him, and he said, exactly. He said, the problem is, is that we lack a bridge between the two disciplines. So that's the homework assignment for all of us to, 
to work on that bridge. And no one would argue that access to safe, high quality, efficient healthcare is critical for mass flourishing. So when we talk about political economy, it gets, um, if it's balanced, that's good. If it's not, it gets to be a distraction and at worst, it can take away, it can corrupt, it can, it can, it can uh, corrode how we uh, propagate appropriate care for each other. And the Romans, and I, and I hope we're not in that era as well here in the United States, but in the Romans, in the, the dying days of the Roman Empire, they used a lot of uh, bread and circuses to distract people from the, from the downward spiral of their society. And so um, we, need, we need to be aware that history does repeat itself. So what are these barriers to mass flourishing through healthcare? It's a conflict we have now between politics and economics. We have the ethics of business driving economics, in my opinion, corroding the ethics of the healing arts. What are the components of the policy or the politics of healthcare? Well, we have a lot, um, probably too numerous to, to mention in just one sl slide for sure. But we have the obvious uh, federal programs that we deal with, Medicare, Medicaid, Accountable Care Act, AKA Obamacare. We have the federal healthcare system, take care of veterans, uh, Veterans Administration. We have Indian Healthcare Service. We have right here in Chicago, a number of uh, federal urban qualified healthcare networks. We have state and other state and local um, county uh, uh, healthcare systems. I mean, Cook County Health and Hospital System is bigger, has the a bigger hospital than most mid-sized cities in the United States. Unfortunately, my experience with it is politics drives it, um, and um, it it it's it it's lost some of its um, key mission focus due to that. We have lobbyists in Washington D.C. that work on behalf of uh, CVS and Aetna and other health insurance modalities. And then we have this concept of the commanding heights. So um, Lenin, uh, father of communism, he said to his followers, in order for us to take over Russia, we have to follow the military principle of taking the commanding heights, not physically, but ideologically. And so when politics and business work together in that regard for power and control, they have the commanding heights. And so that's what we are facing in terms of healthcare uh, here in the United States. And then there's an excellent book called Kleptopia that I just read about the oligarchs that were spawned uh, by the collapse of the Russian, uh, the USSR which also uses that same principle. For supply, right where we are now, clinics, freestanding surgery centers, freestanding MRI uh, facilities, medical schools, academic medical centers, training providers, nursing and allied uh, healthcare professional training. And then we have the other middlemen like now is Medicare Advantage season. So, um, you know, you're watching the World Series last night, and there you go. You're bombarded with Medicaid, Medicare Advantage uh, programs to sign up for. I guess they think most old people, such as myself, are still watching the World Series, although the 
they, they said it was only watched by 9 million people last night where it used to be watched by, you know, a hundred million. So it's a, it's a, a real change as well in our culture. Demand or microeconomics is based on these one-to-one -one interactions that we have or one to our phone interaction with Amazon or, or whomever. But I've always um, had great mentors in medicine and learned a lot about interacting with them and observing them with people and how to interact in a way to gain the trust of people. That's a value that um, is, you know, it's, you, you can't put, um, can't put a dollar amount on that. Transactional is more, you know, like business in general. And so we have a, you know, we have a force and a counter force in taking care of patients. And more and more, I have seen uh, the influence of this transactional type of mindset um, for ordering an MRI or approving surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Now, healthcare insurance, it introduces uh, to some degree moral hazard in that if you are insured, you may not be as careful uh, with how you proceed in life, like car insurance, you know, okay, I, I, dented that other car, I have insurance, you know, I'm not gonna, not gonna sweat it, but either you or someone else will pay for that for sure. And then tragedy of the commons is in regard to us really um, not paying heed to our resources, the sustainability. And we hear this term, you know, the, the national debt is, is unsustainable. Um, spending on Medicare is unsustainable. Well, no one really talks about what that really means. You know, if something's unsustainable, that means something will have to be cut. And um, that's why Medicare Advantage advertising is very devious, in my opinion, because it offers a lot of different services that they say are at no extra cost to whoever signs up for it. Well, someone is gonna bear that cost. And then right around here somewhere is the University of Chicago Department of Economics and Richard Thaler um, has, and others obviously, um, who have also received Nobel Prizes have, have um, distinguished what aspects of biases and, and more, more um, deviously nudges, if you will, to make people behave in certain ways. And so that's utilized by marketing of healthcare services. And we see that uh, all the time on um, uh, any, any program that you watch on, on regular uh, cable TV. And so, Unfortunately, a lot of the services that are offered that way, what is the value of them? And are they really just a, you know, you know eyeglasses for free are, are great. People should not be without eyeglasses in the United States, but what are you trading off for that option? And Thomas Sowell, who's a, a really a remarkable economist, he distinguishes um, as I have tried to between healthcare and what medical care is. And they're not the same. Unfortunately, they're packaged the same way. And right now they're managed to a big degree, at least uh, with the majority of healthcare, even Medicaid is managed by insurance companies. And they restrict if a patient can come and see me at a little safety net hospital, even that they, they maybe can't, that they have to go and wait in line at Stroger hospital in the clinic with a herniated disc and severe sciatica. 
I mean, that, that's just cruel. And Henry Aaron, um, I haven't written to him recently, but I have written to him because um, about 20 some years ago, I took care of his mother at Northwestern and uh, touched base with him about, uh, he's, he's retired and I touched base with him about Medicare and some questions about its sustainability. And he has studied it his entire career, like 50 years. And he, he basically, I'm quoting him from a, a paper, but he basically said the same thing to me that it, there's so many factors that detract from the actual care of patients. And I said, what's the solution? He said, after 50 years, I have no solution. I'm not going to be dismayed, though. We, we can come up with a solution. Uh, Uwe Reinhardt, um, an amazing scholar, he looked at cost as well and, um, and demonstrated that we, we have a lot of waste in our healthcare system. When it comes to spine care, more is less. These are a number of the specialties that are involved with treatment of spinal disorders. Most spinal disorders do not need to be treated actively. That is, they do not need injections. They do not need um, anything more than maybe a short course of medication. They need a change in lifestyle. And, and, and really a analysis of, of the factors that are causing it in each person. That involves speaking to the actual patient and taking that time to figure out what is going on in their life. Soul um, pointed out, as I am, that when you have neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons seeing people for degenerative disc disease and the only thing you have is a hammer, well, that's going to look like a nail to them. And they're going to want to do surgery, replace discs, put in a lot of metal into the spine, fuse the spine, um, I'm operating on a, a nice a lady um, who has not been able to uh, get care elsewhere because she had in 15 years ago, I'm operating on her in two weeks, 15 years ago, she had a, I don't know why, but she had a instrumented fusion. We have five lumbar vertebrae for the non-spine surgeons here from L3 down to her sacrum fused that whole part of her spine. So she could only move at L2, 3. And uh, she is in severe pain because that's the only segment of her spine where she could move. And she has built up degenerative thickening of a ligament that's squeezing her nerve roots. And because she's had previous surgery, there, and it's a Medicare patient. Um, she's been seen and told to do some ridiculous things that would not give her more room. So um, I take care of patients like that, and I'm going to do a simple laminectomy above the level of that fusion to make more room for her nerve roots. And she's 76 years old. We don't need to, to do an extension of our fusion or anything like that. So now we're seeing the results of these increased fusions that um, have come about due to the perverse economic incentives for spine surgeons. We need to think about in every patient, the value equation should involve risk and and analysis of the conventional thinking, like every person with degenerative spine disease needs a fusion. That, that, and what is the risk of that? 
And now we need to recognize the inertia that's been created by these uh, bureaucracies of government and uh, insurance companies. It involves this concept of entrenchment and it's driven by economic um, uh, factors that are influencing the decisions that are being made. And the tragedy is that it's, we continue to pay for things that we probably don't need to pay for. We don't need to even do is what I'm trying to, what I should say, that was inartful. Not everyone needs a fusion for degenerative discs in their spine. And it's, this inequity is a result of this struggle and the inability to change. Overcoming it, it's gonna require on our part, self-resilience. We've heard a lot about this uh, after the COVID pandemic. And um, that's, that's uh, uh, for another discussion. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. So while Medicare, medical care has been called an art to which uh, science is applied, it's, it's foremost an ideal, it's a humanistic pursuit to comfort, first and foremost, give people information and help them to understand what, why they're having pain, especially in regard to the spine. Uh, Dr. Peabody, uh, anyone familiar with this paper? Yeah. It, this is a classic paper everyone should read here. So Dr. Peabody, that's his famous saying, and he was giving this paper knowing that he had inoperable cancer. And he died a few months later, but he devoted his whole career to this aspect. And it's, it's a great read. It's a classic. It's reprinted in JAMA. Um, many other places. You can get it for free. You don't have to uh, be hostage uh, to uh, PubMed or, or, uh, or, you know, one of the other services that want to charge you $51 for a three-page paper. So, um, so what are the ethical and moral principles of medical care? First, do no harm. The other four are this privilege, recognize this privilege that we have for helping someone, potentially helping someone with a condition of their life that's causing them pain or uh, in, inability to work or, or whatever. We have to be aware of the risks that we're putting people through if we do recommend a surgical procedure. And we have to remove ourselves as much as possible when we do recommend treatment, that we are not recommending a fusion because I'm paid by um, Zimmer Biomet as a consultant to use their pedicle screws for fusing their degenerative condition of the spine. And justice, that's, that's the most difficult um, uh, virtue, in my opinion, to uh, be aware of. So what about the diagnosis and treatment for spinal conditions at last? As part of this trillion dollar industry for healthcare, instrumentation of the spine is a ever growing, every year growing part of these expenditures. And the majority of the instrumentation of the spine, and why is instrumentation of the spine done when for this patient, I'm just gonna do a simple laminectomy. You can charge more money for the procedure by adding a fusion to it. And as more and more businesses get involved with this, that's where 
the decision-making process becomes corroded on the part of, of the relationship we have with the patient. It muddies these ethical waters for sure. And it makes taking care of patients more a transactional rather than a relational uh, encounter. It's all about economic self-interest and the invisible hand made visible by, by doing something. So um, two weeks, or last week, last Tuesday, it was uh, 80 degrees and uh, full disclosure, I was, um, I usually have clinic on Tuesdays, but for last Tuesday, I had, um, I had something I was supposed to do and it was canceled and I was on the golf course. So um, I had written uh, Dr. Berwick and this is the other paper that you must read. This was in JAMA very recently. And Salve Lucrum was in his lead paragraph, this is an awesome paper. Salve Lucrum uh, uh, is a Latin phrase that means hail prophet. And he put he uh, points out that ironically, that phrase was in a mosaic floor at uh, uh, Pompeii. And so it was below like 16 feet of volcanic ash. So here was a, in an atrium of a, of a beautiful building. So, um, and he goes on to talk about um, really the amount of money that is expended on Medicare Advantage and the amount of money that's expended on excess, unneeded surgery, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's an awesome paper. So. I'm on the golf course and um, I get a call and it says Don Berwick. So, so I say, Dr. Berwick, and he goes, oh, Dr. Sabolsky, he goes, thank you for your letter. Um, you know, I wish you well on giving your talk. Um, he said, you know, give, give him hell, uh, you know, uh, because he said, we need to, enliven ourselves with the conflicts that are just eroding how we take care of patients and therefore why patients don't trust us as much as they have in the past. So that it was fun. And, and um, so he, he's a, an amazing guy and uh, it was a fun uh, interaction to have with him. And so the inequity of surgical specialty care involves all of these components. Access, as I told you, I'm at a small hospital within five miles of three huge hospitals in Chicago. It's, I can get a patient over there if they have a complex surgery, I think should not be done in a small hospital, but then they're a victim of the system of whether their healthcare plan will actually cover the care that can occur there. The quality, quality is not such an issue. Um, people are well-trained uh, in uh, taking care of spinal problems, but we're biased uh, in terms of taking care of spinal problems, in terms of what are our solutions and do we think of solutions outside of our particular subspecialty. And efficiency, can we get patients seen quicker? And, and, and we need to work on that. And so more and more instrumentation procedures have been performed. In 1986, or neurosurgeons were performing close to zero instrumentation procedures. Uh, nowadays, uh, spine surgery and spine instrumentation procedures in neurosurgery probably takes up at least 75 to 80% of what neurosurgeons do. And whereas we would do laminectomies, I was trained by classical uh, neurosurgeons to do a laminectomy to decompress the uh, one or two levels of the spine for degenerative um, um, uh, stenosis. Now everybody gets a laminectomy plus pedicle screws. 
they'll get that. And some of them will then get also a, that's from the back and then turn them over onto their back and go through the front and put in cages to open up the disc space. If, if you can, if you can decompress from behind and you're fusing them, you don't need to go in front. You, you can make enough room for those exiting nerve roots. You don't need to jack open the disc spaces, but you get paid uh, more money for that. And as a consequence, um, sad uh, case, there was a, a neurosurgeon down in Florida who was a uh, consultant uh, for one of the major spine uh, implant companies about 20 years ago now, and was you know coming to lecture us here and there and everywhere. And he, he was making so much money, he had his own jet, uh, but tragically he crashed it flying to the spine uh, headquarters where he was going to have some meeting or do some consulting or whatever. And, and then we have other uh, uh, neurosurgeons who have invented, you know, some little um, piece that goes with a Medtronic uh, spine fusion tray and he gets paid $17 million. And, um, and, um, goes on to uh, bigger and better things. So it's not unusual, uh, unfortunately, to see this influence. So I, I was trained by some, some great neurosurgeons and, and they would have in the classic people that they knew as well. And, and one of them, um, and, and this is obviously stuck with me, is a spine surgeon must be a mind surgeon. We must look at and talk to the patient, find out what their expectations are and tailor, customize our care to them. And unfortunately that's getting lost in this shuffle for putting in instrumentation. Um, Dr. Thaler uh, of uh, the book Nudge would I think endorse that as a, as a good nudge. So um, I'm always looking for ways to increase value. And um, in the Wall Street Journal, three years ago now, I saw this article. So this is Virgil Carter. Virgil Carter was my boyhood hero. He was a quarterback for the Chicago Bears. Back then, so this is in the um, early 70s. Back then, to be a pro football player, you used to have to have a side gig. And you know, some of the, most of them were salesmen. But Virgil Carter was a very smart guy. He got his MBA while well, he's playing for the Bears from Northwestern. And right here, he's using one of the few computers that uh, was uh, in action at that time, and that's his wife. And he took the plays from and every in every football team. And I've been on the sidelines as a, as a Bears neurosurgeon. There's a there's a person who is the quality control coach who charts every play. Twenty yard line run gain 2.5 yards. They chart every play. So back then they were, still, they were doing that. He took that and, um, and digitalized it and came up with the analysis they do now, the books they have now where you got a guy sitting up in the booth, it's third down on the Bears 10 yard line. What's the, you know, it's not a book anymore, but you know, back then, what, what does the book say? What what's the best play? And you know, then you call it in right away. You know, run off, off the right side with uh, with Gail Sarris. You know, that was a high percentage. So anyway, he did that. He's the father of NFL analytics. He's also the father, if you will, of um, he went into the insurance industry after this and looked at um, you know lifespan of people and 
you know, and if they had, you know, some interaction or some illness, what would happen to them? So at any rate, I saw this article and I Googled him. He lives in uh, Claremont, California. And I wrote him a letter and I said, uh, dear Mr. Carter, I've been a fan of yours since, you know, the early 70s. And I'm interested in expected value for if I tell Mrs. Smith that we're going to do a three level laminectomy, I'd like to tell her more than, you know, a doctor, you know, she asked me, you know, what's the percentage of success, you know, and, and I have to say, well, I've done a thousand of these and, you know, blah, 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 but I want to be able to have these measures so we can tell people, you know, that if you have a fusion, whatever. So um, long story, or it is a long story, but shorter, uh, Virgil called me and um, we had a great conversation about this. He thought it was an awesome idea, but he, but he said, Doc, he said, you've got to get data from the insurance companies. <laughs> I'm still waiting, <laughs> still waiting. So back then you could get, you know, data a lot easier than you can now, but um, awesome man. And um, just, just fun, you know, to interact with people who think outside the box and, and create value. So it takes, you know, all of us to, you know, come up with these ideas and come up with this interest for how we can, how we can create actual value for patients. And for me, it's thinking about how I can optimize um, my decision-making for my patients, you know, in this little hospital on the, on the west side of Chicago, who knows, who knows where that'll lead. We have to always bear in mind, I'm all, as I said, a spine surgeon uh, must be a mind surgeon. We have to know what the patient's expectations are. And we can develop, you know, based on that, some technology, which I'm also working on to, to improve uh, safety of patient care in the operating room. Future challenges. I think um, uh, AI will help us uh, in this respect. It will, will allow us to create a frequency distribution for what happens when we do, you know, uh, parathyroid surgery on, you know, different, different age groups. But we can, you know, we, we have to somehow also factor in, that's why I think AI will be helpful, but we'll still need the interaction. We'll need the, you know, the, the, the smart people that we are to, translate that for our patients and help them with their decisions. AMA's code of ethics, we alluded to a little bit of that. So I'm gonna wind this down now. So I um, told you I would talk about the Marines and uh, fortunately uh, my son and, and my son-in-law are both Marines. Uh, my son, um, this was back in uh, 2000 and uh, 12, he had just graduated from officer basic school of the Marine Corps. And uh, he's 22, 23 years old at that time. And their training is such, he's going to become the boss of 40 Marine infantrymen. And the training is such that the Marines have no problems and the, the structure of their organization, they have no problems. You know, his sergeant was 38 years old and uh, when he was assigned to his platoon and they deployed and I, and I may become a little emotional about this, but they deployed and um, for nine months and um, they saw some action and um, and then it, he came back Excuse me. and um, I asked the sergeant, um, you know, how did it go with, with uh, Eric? And he said, oh, the Lieutenant, 
he's a great guy. He goes, um, he would said, I, I was always concerned that he wasn't getting enough sleep. And, um, you know, he would, he would sleep one or two hours a night, always looking at after his guys and all that. And, and I said, well, that, that sounds like internship, right? Right, Peter? <laughs> sleep one or two hours a night. But, but uh, no one was trying to kill us that I know of at, at that time. But um, so um, the Marines, you know, they have something. And, and fortunately, it's been written up by Simon Sinek. So for us to have the benefit, we have to learn so much in terms of, of patient care that I think we get slighted on the leadership uh, part of it. And it's taken me all these years and reading so many books. And, and Peter, I know you're the same way um, that we finally, you know, get, you know, a, a con you know, we get a feel for what leadership is. But the but I reckon I, I recommend that book. And and uh, and Professor Carzi talks about um, um, he's a, he's a, an amazing guy. Uh, he talked about finite and infinite games. So. When we take care of a patient, we do a procedure, do it well, that's all good. But, but what we're doing is we want to create value for the future. And so that needs to, we need to consider that as well. And so uh, one of my uh, last uh, kind of mentors from afar is, uh, is a story of this country doctor in England. And uh, I, reckon, I recommend this book as well. And Yesterday, I'm in my clinic, and uh, I have this week's uh, JAMA, and um, I'm happy to say that um, it was written up about a fortunate woman, so a follow-up uh, of this doctor's practice in England and, and his, um, his credo, which she, which she follows, and um, so we all have a privilege here to, to do so much. Um, it's hard because the work is hard. Um, the sacrifice is great, but um, you know, uh, let's take um, inspiration from the Marines and and uh, a fortunate man and woman, and um, continue to create value uh, for our patients. Thank you. So thank you very much. That was really, really, really wonderful. And I guess I'm clearly, you know, you're presenting us with a personal challenge to do good for our patients. Um, and, and ultimately, I mean, I think that's where it all comes into what it comes down to. Is there is there some other uh, set of economic incentives or regulatory oversight that can push us to do the right thing? Because you know you mentioned at the beginning, you know you want to get an MRI, but you've got to go through multiple people to get it done. In theory, that's designed to prevent low quality care, low value care. But it does seem as though these are often roadblocks. And the ultimate question is, you know, is someone going to be recommended an operation or not? And often that doesn't have a lot of those Absolutely. So so Uwe Reinhardt talked about costs. So that so that's what we're talking about. What what we're interested in here is ethics of of recommending something and the cost of it not only in terms of dollars but in terms of resources and the tragedy of the commons you know we sustainability and so that's where uh, peter you know your center here um you know writing papers that are that get into health economics you know, they get into other journals that force the issue. And, you know, I'd obviously be happy to, to collaborate uh, with anyone who would 
would want to do that. But we focus, uh, so I've been to uh, Mike Porter's uh, course, the famous Harvard professor, brilliant man, made his uh, 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 way to fame with uh, five courses of strategy. But um, but kind of, I've been, re I'm reverse engineering. He's like forward engineer. He, and he is an engineer, so this is how they work. So then he said, you know, I've conquered strategy. I'm going to conquer healthcare. So he and, and his associate write a book that's this thing on redefining healthcare value or redefining healthcare. And it is slow going. And, and you know, I'm, I'm trying, I mean, hey, it's, it's just my assessment as a, as a practitioner. And, and I've had this discussion with him when you attend the course, you know, you get to eat dinner with them and all this stuff, but they're missing the point. The point is, is and you know, and, and thank you all for your, your attention. The point is, is that the, the value of what we do in terms of interaction and, and value of decision-making is really what no one else can take away from us. That, that keeps me faxing stuff to whoever, because I know this patient needs an operation, you know, but it doesn't have to be that way. And so I don't know, health economics or whomever, where we talk about the value of decision-making or uh, decision-making under stress and uncertainty, which is surgery, you know, and any, uh, you know, and ICU and, and ER and all this, we don't get enough, um, we don't get that message out there.
His efforts of Sandra Lakish that oh, it's not much gas for the food and buying the best methods. I, I look at it as, as like I said, it's a struggle to uh, take care of food. Thank you very much uh, for the listening.